character. She wants to remember <laughs> last night for the rest of her life. And she turns to her and she says, what city are we in? And she says, Waterloo. And Terry goes, there's a Waterloo in every state. There's four. <laughs> four Waterloos in every state. Get it, girl. <laughs> four. <laughs> Terry's been activated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can make this our thing. Don't worry about the chafing. We'll just slap a little lotion on it. It'll be fine. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to season two of Cracking Spines. We went on a little bit of hiatus. All of it's Candace's fault. None of it's mine. Uh, but we're back to uh, celebrate the month of Pride. And we are going to be starting with The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. Yes. Uh, if you're new here, please tell everyone you know about this podcast. Rave about it. Tell them it's the most amazing thing you've ever heard. And if you don't do this, then that'll let us know that you're a horrible person and we don't like you. Yeah. You can check out our store at kit.co slash cracking spines podcast that's k-i-t dot c-o slash cracking spines podcast here you can find all our reading materials the books the book lists anything you could possibly need that we use ourselves and we stand by this is a part of the episode where we talk about our amazing sponsors. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have any as we are a new podcast. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please email us at info at cracking spines podcast dot com. OK, oh. welcome back. <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> OK, so um, today we're kicking off June. We're doing uh, lesbian for the first week, gay for the second week, bisexual for the third week and trans for the fourth week. As you can uh, probably guess from that, we're doing uh, LGBT. And then next year during Pride, we're going to work in um, more of the queer side, the intersex, the asexual, that, which queer also includes pansexual and demisexual. So it'll probably be uh, PDIA for next year. So that'll be fun. Mm -hmm. So why don't you uh, give us a description? Like we're going to read. <laughs> A little rusty, guys. <laughs> okay. The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. A chance encounter between two lonely women leads to a passionate romance in this lesbian cult classic. Therese, a struggling young sales clerk, and Carol, a homemaker in the midst of a bitter divorce, abandon their oppressive daily routines for the freedom of the open road where their love can blossom. But their newly discovered bliss is shattered when Carol is forced to choose between her child and her lover. Author Patricia Highsmith is best known for her psychological thriller Strangers on a Train and the talented Mr. Ripley. Originally published in 1952 under a pseudonym, The Price of Salt was heralded as the novel of a love society forbids. Highsmith's sensitive treatment of fully realized characters who defy stereotypes about homosexuality marks a departure from previous lesbian pulp fiction. Erotic, eloquent, and suspenseful, this story offers an honest look at the necessity of being true to oneself. The story opens up with Teresa and, or Therese, or Terry. She's, she's working a job in basically a... Macy's or a Bloomingdale's yeah, in downtown like Manhattan. A department store. Right. <clears throat> and so uh, she's miserable. She's a set designer uh, by trade. Uh, she's, or she was trained to be a set designer for Broadway and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, she has a troubled past with... Uh, a lack of parents, her mom and her contentious relationship. She grew up in a school where half the kids there didn't have parents. Some did. It's like a whole thing. Yeah. She's in a relationship with a man that she's really not interested in. She's kind of just like biding her time with him, which is fine. You don't realize it until later, but she's like 19. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's very young, 20 young. maybe. And like, it doesn't seem like it, but yeah, she's pretty young in it. And they set that up a little bit in the, the juxtaposition of her and the older sales mm -hmm. ladies. Mrs. Like Mrs. Robichet. But it isn't until later that you realize how young she is. Like yeah. She, she's not 21, 22. She's, she's 19. So. And it like also speaks to, because this took place in what, like the 50s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it also speaks to how much more pe like people of a younger age were expected to be much more of an adult. And then it's quickly, our generation and the mm -hmm. generation right before us realized uh, the older generations were robbing us of a decent life. And now we live longer and we look younger for a lot longer. So mm -hmm. we meet her on her first day of the job. Yes. Where she's having lunch after kind of going through an orientation and she meets Mrs. Robocheck. Mrs. Robocheck. Yeah. And this is a seasonal job that she's doing right around the Christmas, Christmas time yeah time and um Mrs. Robichuk I think there's a really imp a bit, there, there's importance to the character of Mrs. Robichuk because it's the first time the first description of her noticing a woman in detail yes down to like the dirt under her nails the chipped off uh nail polish the roundness of her shoulders the yeah, yeah. the bags under her eyes <laughs> like it just 
Uh, and she's kind of a bitch the way she describes yes. her. I was like, you're being a dick, lady. And that carries on. Her mm-hmm. her evaluation of beautiful and ugly mm-hmm. and how she reacts and feels and treats people who she deems unattractive. Yeah. Is... And no one ever really says what she looks like. So mm, kind of curious. But at the same time, while she has this reaction to her, she still goes along with, you know, meeting up with her for coffee and following her home for dinner. And yeah. Well, she didn't, like, follow her. She was invited back. Well, and yeah, then, like, she didn't, like, stalk her She's home. like, this house is a mess. But she's commenting on her unattractiveness in her head. And, and mm-hmm. then she's also musing about how lonely she is. So when she sees Mrs. Robichek having coffee at a diner after work, she approaches her. Yeah. Therese goes up to her, strikes up a conversation, and, like, comments that she doesn't seem super happy to see Therese, but she sort of keeps, like, takes the seat anyway next to her. Mm-hmm. You know, and she's like, do you, do you want to come back for dinner? But like you said, she's like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be around her. And it's like... <laughs> <laughs> in a completely like self-created situation. Yeah, where like she created the situation, now she's mad about it. Yeah, <laughs> conservative. <laughs> and she's like, with, at, like <laughs> she sits down in the chair and she's like practically having a panic attack because she doesn't want to be there, but she doesn't know what to say. And the woman's like, just lay down and take a nap if you're that. Uh, their tired. shoulders were like touching, and like she's like, this is awkward. Yeah. Why'd you sit there? But she won't leave. It yeah. was this really weird, like, like I thought it established how, like, she may have all these opinions, but this girl will not say boo. Speaking she- of opinions, I'm not sure if you guys can tell, but we have an opinion on Terry. Yeah. Um, am I supposed to feel sorry for her? Because I don't. I, I didn't like Terry till the end. Yeah. Terry comes full circle a little uh, bit. Terry, like, Terry has this, like, the personality of this character, the character arc of Terry um, is very much, like, judgmental pushover to vulnerable pushover to re not re not even reclaiming but like for the first time ever claiming dominance in Mm -hmm. her interpersonal relationships terry strikes me in the beginning as someone who has a lot of opinions about other people while distracting herself from the fact that she has no idea who she is that part (laughs) and uh dick that's what i call richard yeah her quasi boyfriend yeah she's told several times i don't like you (laughs) yeah she's like i don't love you and he just keeps pushing it on her (sighs) he can sense she doesn't know who she is. Well, he gaslights trying, the shit out of and her. And he's trying to tell her who she is because he can sense she doesn't know it. Yeah, and you she's know? like, mm, you're right. I don't know it, but you don't know either. So <laughs> shut up. She's like, I don't know who I am, but I know I don't like you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know what I don't like. Right. <laughs> so, mm, fuck off. So like a week into working this job, we've met Richard, who's like, thinks he's her boyfriend, wants to take her to Europe for... A month or or the summer. Her mom, his mom, wants to make her some like dress with like fucking embroidery, and she's like, "No, right. don't do, don't do that." Right. So, I'll pass. Right. She like breaks up with him for like the third time, apparently. Right. Right before we meet Carol, we've established that like she has opinions. She doesn't say them a lot, but she reserves the right to be pissed off that people don't treat her the way she wants to be treated. She's a very nineteen-year-old. <sighs> Nineteen year old girl living in New York. I mean, she does want to work in the theater. So right. of course I'm sure everything is so much more dramatic in her head. However, she meets Carol while working behind the counter. There's a lot of conversations about dolls that people want. Who fucking cares? She Moving works in, on. The, in the toy department. Mm-hmm. So Carol comes in shopping for for a doll. A doll for her daughter Rindy. And when she sees Carol for the first time, that's Carol stops dead in her tracks, time stops, sort of. Oh, yeah, like, that's like, the way it's described. Like you know, it, this is what it was. Carol was the dorky nerd in the teen like rom-com and she came down the stairs and took her ponytail out and her glasses off. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, she opens the the fur coat to put her hands on her hips and that's where she, she said, can see her boobies. and she could see her body and it just like stopped her in her tracks. And- body is code for boobies. Um <laughs> and so that wasn't really what like grabbed her. What really grabbed her was that Carol was like Merry Christmas. <laughs> and <then> she laughs. laughs. And she's like, oh, she's the first first person while I've been working here to be nice enough to say Merry Christmas. So then she's like, mm, stage five clinger and writes her a note. This is so Terry, though. She goes out of her way to find her address on the sales slip to go downstairs, buy a Christmas card, write out a note about, I don't even remember what she says. And she signs it employee 614-E. Yeah. So when Carol calls the store, she thinks it's the man that had Helped sold her, her something in another department. Yeah. But it's like Terry went through all of that and then signed it employee 614-E or whatever it was. And she's like... Mm. Upset that Carol was like, oh, it's you. Like, like yeah, she doesn't know it's you. She didn't even sign your fucking name. <laughs> like, what are you mad about? What is the problem here? <laughs> 
a little passive aggressive there, Terry. Yeah. And then so then it becomes a very much like, let's go for a drive because that's all they did back then because it was boring as shit. So mm-hmm. they would get in the car and drive around. The green car. Oh, this fucking word green. This How does this keep s- happening to us? Second time. At least it was the first book. It was the second book last season where we don't usually talk about it, <laughs> but I knew I could get away with saying this in a voice message. I, uh, or I think I may have sent it via text to Candace. I said, if this bitch says green one, one more, more fucking time. <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> Like, fuck, dude. Like, it, everything was green. Yep. Green, 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 green. Like, but back to the story. So it becomes this whole situation of, like, push, pull. Are we? Are we not? We're not really telling each other the secret that we're both keeping with each other. It's right. very that. They go to dinner. She invites her over to her house. They go for a drive. She writes a love letter, never gives it to her. All it's these, her undoing. All these outings are very much this, like, you know. The, uh, can we talk about the, like, take your shoes and your skirt off or whatever to lay down and take a nap? That was weird. Yeah, it was. And like, if it, you're, your do you first want something date, to drink? I'd like some hot milk. Oh, God. And she's like, it's all scummy on top. Yeah. <laughs> and she loved it. What? What? <sighs> yeah. It was like forced intimacy is what it felt like. Is John, if reading? anybody was around in the 50s, like cognitive, um, why? <laughs> like, why, why? What was your guys' game plan back then? Well, because by then, when she finally brought her to her house for the first time and it was like, you know, come in and she couldn't have been there for very long before it was take off your shoes and your skirt and take a nap because you look tired. It had been established <laughs> to Carol that she's 19. Yeah. And I felt like that scene just really made that apparent. Yeah. Tucking her in, in the twin bed. With- and it, it, this, so she had an issue with her mom. And eventually when she was like 14 or something like that, she told her mom, don't ever come back here. Mm-hmm. And then um, the school asked her mom for like $200 or whatever. And her mom gave it to them. And she's like, I want to pay my mom that back because she wants nothing to do with her mom. She wants to. And Carol made a really good point. Like she's like, you're still a child because you keep thinking about wanting to pay that back. The day you stop caring about that, that's the day you become an adult. Mm-hmm. But this is Carol. <laughs> admittedly referring to yeah terry as a child this the, you're seeing this like i felt like there was this whole um and i don't want to push this into the wrong direction but i felt like there was this whole uh, power dynamic there that was taking place i didn't really see this so much as the relationship between two women i saw this as a relationship of a woman with herself a woman getting mm-hmm. to know herself and yeah. like becoming learning to trust who she was in this and so like it felt very like mommy issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, again, Carol not only knows in that moment that she's 19, she's already told her the story of her mom's abandonment. Yeah. So Carol's aware of that as well as she's sort of makeshift stepping into this role. And then, and then like Dick gets in, introduced to Carol and she's like intertwining them and she's like flirting with this idea. Carol t- really wants to meet him. Like when she's telling her about him, like Terry even regrets even bringing it up. That she's like, "There's this guy. He's got feelings for me. I don't really like him." And she's he's like, "He's a problem. You should call him. You should you should bring she's him." She's like, around. "I want to see if I can out gaslight him. Bring him. Bring <laughs> it." She's like, "Oh, I'm just with." I'm it with felt Richard. it felt like a power move. It did. Like, feel like I it. felt like she was whipping her dick out to be like twice you should, your size. You should buddy. just bring him along. Like she was constantly trying to and then bring him into it. Harg, her husband. Harg, Carol's husband. Harg. Yeah. <laughs> So that is how it was pronounced. Okay. Harg. <laughs> Harg. His name is Harg. Say Harg one more time. <laughs> I mean, fucking, if I do, I'm going to have to cough up some phlegm. <laughs> like, it, and then he shows up at the park. She walks away. Yeah. So as, as Carol and, and Terry are building this relationship, we have what we just talked about, which is the Richard thing. She tells yeah. him about Richard and Carol's like, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. As we are learning about Harg, the estranged, soon to be divorced husband of Carol, that Terry is like afraid of. Yeah. And doesn't want anything to do with. It's Carol's like, they seem very cordial when we first meet him. Yeah. He comes over to get something from he even Randy. He even says at some point, he thinks she's a beautiful woman. And he thinks she's fine. Like, he and has no like, problem with her. Yeah, he's like, get her out for more walks. Make sure she, you know, she's getting out and doing things. Like He's, he's like, she's old. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> he's cordial and, like, friendly. <laughs> he's such a bitch. He's like, <laughs> Make sure you walk, Carol. <laughs> Hi, old. <laughs> make, sure, make, sure, make sure you chew her food for her. <laughs> She's three so walks the, a day. This, this book is this book is like four parts. Like I really wish I would have broken it down into four parts, but I can break the four parts down for you. It's this like uh, push pull budding of a relationship, right? Where they're they're like, yeah, we're feeling each other. Here's the side action we got going on because Carol's in the middle of her divorce. She's in the middle of trying to get rid of this other guy. 
um, Terry is. And then, you know, the next portion of that is they're going on this road trip or trip. whether they're starting their relationship, the relationship is becoming something. So you have the call to action, which is this, I get to, I get to talk about the hero's journey. Yeah. The call to action, which is, uh, meeting Carol and whatnot. And then when she gives Carol that like card and that starts, that's the crossing of the threshold. Mm hmm. Then they go into building their relationship. For sure. Like ushering us right into the second part of this book is Abby. So Abby is- How do you feel about Abby? I really loved her and I wanted her to be so much more of a character. Yeah. (laughs) My my bittersweet feelings about Abby is I'm pissed in where she does not show up in the book, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like Abby should have got a spinoff. She was fantastic. Abby should fully get a spinoff. I feel like she could have been more sarcastic too. So Abby's Carol's best friend. Yes. Childhood best friend. Well, more than that. Yeah. Like they Well, we don't know that yet, but she is her heir. Yeah, I mean, we find out. So um they're friends. It's like clear that Abby knows what's going on. And it's clear the way I read it was Abby knew that Carol was a muff diver. You know what I mean? Like she fully like motorboated vertical smiles. Mm-hmm. So uh <laughs> Well the Abby, Terry, Carol, the the three of them, that day. Di- Terry can pick up that they're not just friends, but she can't put her finger on why or how. Abby can tell real quick what's going on with Terry's infatuation with Carol. So the three of them watching them interact, whether they were all together or like when Abby takes Terry out to lunch. Yeah. To have this conversation about like, you seem to really like Carol, huh? Like that protective friend thing. It's like level with me. Yeah. (laughs) What is this? (laughs) In her journey to what you, you know, that. Oh, we met in a store. Full on gaydar at the end. that, That little like, interaction between the three of them of like we know we all know we're not saying well what i love about what what was done here is um the reason like i was thinking about this the other day uh when it comes to those that are non-binary and us using they them there i find it not hard for me to switch those pronouns and the reason why is because when you're in the closet with people and you're referring to the person you're with. So it's like, oh, like, why aren't you dating? Oh, I'm dating someone. Oh, who? well, they are really cool. They're like, you know, someone I've known for a long time and use very gender neutral. So that way you're not feeling like you're lying to a person, but mm-hmm. at the same time, you're not giving them the full truth. Yeah. And I feel like that was highlighted so well. Yeah. And when she goes, we met in a store. Mm-hmm. Like, not how did you meet in the store? Like, what, like, were you working there? Like, it was... Or how did you get to know each other outside of the store? Yeah, it was just like... We met at the store. We met at the store. Because that, that means, like, that could be like, oh, we had the same interest in something and just got to talking it's and really then blah, 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 blah. You know, otherwise, but when it's like, oh, you were working there and she was shopping there, then it becomes like... I wrote her a letter. <laughs> so how did you guys end up... Yeah. <laughs> The full story and Abby sees right through it. Yeah, and she's like, uh huh. Yeah, I already know the story. <laughs> Just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are so many themes in this that happen in the everyday life. Still to this day, happens. This takes place in the fifties. Uh, happens in the everyday life of people that are LGBTQ plus. Like the vague language when it comes to describing how you know somebody that it's like because even when you were dating someone and you guys were both in the closet and you were around and people were like, how'd you guys meet? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, we uh, ran into you. Like, oh, like, uh, like, right. You sometimes, if you're smart, you had a fucking story ready to go. Right. You At know? a bar. Now, which bar? At a bar. At a bar. <laughs> At a bar. Playing darts. <laughs> and then, I mean, it goes into uh, later on, there's like a situation where she's being outed. There's a situation where they're being mm-hmm. punished, mm-hmm. where it's being used against them legally. And like, it's <sighs> all four sections, all four phases of this book have very big themes within the lgbt very big very and it's they're and they're written so nonchalantly Mm -hmm. that like hearing it i was like oh yeah i've been there wait a minute like there's so many moments where i was like yeah i've been there wait Mm -hmm. like this relationship with carol and uh terry carol has this like i hate people like carol in a relationship where they have all this control and they can see the other person needs something like and they're like well i'll leave you hanging Mm -hmm. because i can always go back to you whenever i need you Mm -hmm. this whole like you'll be there for me when i want i don't have to be there for you yeah because there are periods where in the beginning she calls her she shows up at her house she shows up at her work she and then she just disappears yeah and you see terry doing that thing that she's when am i gonna see you again she's not making plans on the hopes that carol drops by Yep. She's not leaving the house on the hopes that Carol calls. Yeah. She quickly, quickly falls into that role. Yeah. Like, hey, I'll be and here when you need me. Which makes Richard more aggressive. Yeah. Because Richard's like, you won't do that shit for me. It's because you're a dick. Yeah. Yeah. So 
They planned this trip together. That is both a nickname and a moniker. No kidding. They planned this trip together where they're going to road trip across America. Yes. And this road trip feels very vanilla. um, What are their names? Hold hands, go off a cliff together. Thelma and Louise. It's very, it feels very like vanilla Thelma and Louise. Yeah, it's a little anticlimactic. I mean, first first of all, they're road tripping across America in February. Yeah. So, so bleak rain, snow is in a dis- car from the fifties. Yeah. So like that's a green car at that. But it is distraction for Carol. It's it it's not this big romantic gesture. Carol is losing her divorce. She's actively losing her divorce. And so what has happened right around the time she meets Terry is that there's this like three month period where she can't see her kid. Yeah. In this time, go to your lawyer, go to go to his lawyer. They're going to reconvene for the actual divorce proceedings. So she's And planning- that is because Harg knew about, here we go, Abby and Carol had a little like thing Their for flame. a little while. Mm-hmm. Abby had, had feelings for Carol since they were young, wrote her like letters when they were in school because they went to different schools. So they ended up trying something out. It didn't work. They stayed friends. Weird. He knows about it. He's not happy about it, but- it's- He's aware that it happened. So when he sees- Terry at the house. He's right. like, oh, here we go again. But my point was that this is not this big romantic gesture. I've fallen in love with Terry and I want to take her on a trip. Carol's going no matter what. Oh, can we just talk about she, real quick? Like, She wants a distraction from the fact that she can't see her kid for 90 days. Mm-hmm. That's why this trip is happening. And uh, trying to make it to their home, ho- her home state of Washington. <laughs> like, how do we end up here again? Yeah. We always find a book that takes us back home. Um, but what I found really strange was how, like, Take their love on the open road. What begrudging. The first time of terrible. them going, I love you to each other was just like, I love you. Like it wasn't a moment. Yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of like said in passing. I was like, did she hear you? <laughs> like, she react? Yeah. Like, cause they, they, they say it to each other. Like they've been saying it for years. Right. She even says at one point, all the darlings and the sweeties and the honeys. And mm-hmm. she's like, I love it when she calls me that. Do you? Cause like you, when you guys said, I love you to each other, it wasn't like a moment that you st- let stop time for mm-hmm. you. It went from, and that was the other thing. On this road trip, it starts off that the affection was Carol kissing her on the forehead a lot. Yeah. That affection turned more passionate and and erotic, but it starts as a lot of forehead kissing and tucking her in at night. Yeah. That's where we start physically in their relationship. It's like, it's when they hit the road. They like find a love for each other. Like they find this companionship, this companionship, this lesbianic companionship with each other but almost they're putting the other in the role of something that they're missing out on Mm -hmm. oh like terry's putting carol in the role of mother uh relying on her needing her waiting for her da 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 carol's kind of putting uh terry in the position of rindy or somebody she can take care of yeah that empty caretaker void that she has which is the whole genesis of this trip is that (sighs) she's got to get out of town because she can't be there for rindy so The way she talked about the relationship with Abby when she had it with Abby, the relationship with Harg when she had it with Harg, I felt like that was foreshadowing that uh, Carol was going to fail Terry in this relationship. Oh, okay. Okay. Like I just saw like that as a part of Carol's like shtick is to fail people around her. And like you said, she has this void of needing to be needed. Yeah. And it's like there's a void there because you fail people. Right. (laughs) That's a really good call out. Yeah. I, the whole time I'm like when is this going to fall apart yeah like just because of how she was and she's so nonchalant mm-hmm. about what she had with Abby I bet it meant a lot more to Abby than it meant to Carol what she had with Harg Harg's clearly like upset over it well I'm sure it meant more I mean Abby taking Terry out to lunch before they go on their road trip to make sure that like Abby just wanted eyes on her while she asked pertinent questions she just wanted to see the look on Terry's face when she asked her a handful of things that's Abby clearly. If I can't have her, I want to make sure the person that exactly. does is going to be doing it right by her, which mm-hmm. go Abby. So their relationship starts evolving on the trip until Waterloo. Oh, yeah. Is that where what's his, the detective comes in? No, Waterloo is where they finally just give in. This and- is part two. <laughs> We're still on part two. Yeah. So this is sort of like the pinnacle of their bliss on this trip because it's shortly thereafter that they find out that it's this isn't as pure of a trip as they thought. So Waterloo is when they finally, their physical relationship happens. That's where they bump uglies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they double click each other's mouths. <laughs> what other euphemisms do I know? You know what I loved about this was that the next morning, 
<laughs> Terry gets up and she takes in the room. She takes in all of the furniture because she just wants to remember. All of the green furniture. She wants to remember <laughs> last night for the rest of her life. And she turns to her and she says, what city are we in? And she says, and Carol goes, Waterloo. And they both laugh because they have the same thought, which is we're going to always remember Waterloo forever. <laughs> and Terry goes, there's a Waterloo in every state. There's four. <laughs> four Waterloos in every state. I get it, girl. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> four. <laughs> Terry's been activated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can make this our thing. <laughs> Don't worry about the chafing. We'll just slap a little lotion on it. It'll be fine. <laughs> so this is where it starts to take a turn. Yes. because The morning after wears off real quick when we discover that they're being followed. Being followed. Abby right. gives her the heads up in the most creative way. Do I don't remember how roll, Abby did it. They roll into Denver, into the hotel that they were scheduled to go into. And mm -hmm. there's a telegram from Abby waiting for her that says, go get a telegram at this hotel. And she goes to that oh, hotel. Oh, yeah. Abby's slick. She's like, hey, go here instead. So, you're, like, Terry's just sort of following her like a puppy as she goes from hotel to Terry, hotel. follow her like a puppy? Yeah. No. <laughs> Lost. Like, <laughs> what, whatever could be the matter and like she has this like maybe Abby's sick just com but it was like what like two three hotels a phone booth she finally gets in contact <sighs> should with I give a dude a handy J behind the uh, the local Arco <laughs> turns out wasn't part of the plan she felt really weird about it afterwards <laughs> he's like you didn't have to do that it was actually a post-it note on the back floor <laughs> behind me <laughs> she's like oh <laughs> sorry <laughs> He's like, I don't even like women. <laughs> and then she gets the message. Yeah, that Abby's like, you're you're being followed. There's a detective that your husband has put on the case to get all the evidence he could ever want in this divorce. And that's when Terry realizes that she's seen the same guy. Twice. In two different Down cities. to the being able to remember the color of his shoes. Right. Like, so they're being followed. They're like, all right. And they go back to the hotel and this and that. They find the fucking... Dictaphone. Dictaphone. Just shh, don't say anything, whatever. How much could he possibly have? And then they're driving down the highway. And, you know, she's like, I'm... Carol's like, absolutely not. No. And so she's like, yo, pull over, bro. And he's like, all right. And he pulls over and she's like... What's up? Like, give me the give me the rolls of film or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't got any. She's like, bullshit, you don't got any. I know you got it. He's like, well, I sent so much of it already back. I'm telling you, go back now. Go back now. And I'm like, well, if you're already caught, bitch, just fucking enjoy the rest of your time. Shit, might as well. There's nothing you can do about it. So Because she thinks he's bluffing and that what he has on him is all that he has. Yeah. But he has sent everything back to New York. Everything back. The only thing he has is shit he most recently collected. Right. And so... And the Waterloo <laughs> tapes have been sent to New York. Yeah. <laughs> So she challenges him and he's like, I don't, he's like, I need cash. She's like, I don't got, he's, well, she's like, let me give you a check. And he's like, I don't take checks. I want cash. And she's like, I don't have cash. He's like, I'll take a check. Yeah. I'm like, that was hard. <laughs> I, like, I would have like fucking written that check so backwards. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> uh, I thought like, I was like, uh oh, gun. She's going to kill this man. That's what I thought. And then she didn't. I was like, you bitch, there's nobody on that highway. Obviously, if you're like, hey, pull over, asshole. Right. I want to see your driver's license. You know, very Bette Midler on a broom. Well, she she knew. That it, she told Terry, oh, he's bluffing. I just purchased everything. But Carol knew. Yeah. She knew that it was over, that, that he had sent everything, because she immediately gets in, like, a depressive state. Yeah. And, well, I mean, she's like, oh, he's just bluffing. And then you have, you know... Um, Terry with her arm around her, like squeezing her shoulder pad or whatever the fuck it was. Yes. I'm like, why is that a description? Okay. Read the room, Terry. <laughs> yeah. She's like, this is nice. And she's like. Right. So they stop in the next town and Carol kind of spends the next, what, 12, 12 I don't want to be here. I want to stay here. I want to move here. I want to go over there. I don't drinking stay herself here. into a depressive state until she finally wakes up and decides, I, I, I have to go back. I have to go back. It's about my kid, man. And so leaves I could lose her my there. Kid. Yeah. And leaves Terry there. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to, I'm going to fly home. You wait here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with my car. In Colorado, I think they were. Utah. They were, they, no, they went back. They were in Colorado after that because they went to Salt Lake and then now they're over by Colorado Springs. And she's like, I'll be back. Just wait here. Like she's going to the fucking corner store. <laughs> like this is fucking normal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Terry's like, okay, bet. <laughs> so where's your friend? She'll be here. <laughs> like. Fucking Carol has taken the, the the ghost game up from like standing somebody up at a res at like a table in a restaurant to a fucking hotel room. Yeah, 
in another state. Across the country. <laughs> she leaves her there. And this is where Terry's like, this is an existential crisis for Terry the whole way through. It's just not, it, it doesn't play out or read that way, you know. But this is a pivotal moment for her. Big time. Because now now she's actually forced to be alone. She doesn't have dick mm -hmm. gaslighting her. Mm -hmm. She's in the middle of a full gas, like a fucking, she's going to the gaslighting Olympics right now. Oh, yeah. And she's going to come out with the gold, I think. I think she came out with the gold. Uh, I, I did not like Terry this entire time. I'm like, you're, you're super judgmental. You have no room to fucking speak. Like, you are a pushover. Right. I did like the fact that as a, from woman to, well, from woman to woman, she's a pushover. Mm -hmm. But when it came to like her to Dick, she was, <laughs> Dick was the pushover. Right. Like, like I loved that. Like, yeah. stick yeah. to the man. But um, the, before we get into the, her being alone, there was something that was said that just fucking hit me so hard. Um, it was a thought that Terry had while uh, all this was going down. But it says it was a, it was malice she had seen in his smile. Bunch of other fluffy shit. She has seen just now what she had sensed before, that the whole world was ready to be their enemy. And suddenly, what she and Carol had together seemed no longer uh, seemed no longer like love or anything happy, but a monster between them with each of them caught in a fist. Oh, yeah. I read that and I was like, holy shit. This right here, this is what happens when two people find each other and one of them is being outed, which puts the other one in danger of being outed. And mm -hmm. all they want to do is be able to love each other and just live. <clears throat> and this is a pure example of the rest of the world being like, hey, we want to not mind our own fucking business. And not only that, but like put you in some kind of danger, whether it's social, physical, mental, emotional. You're, you, we're putting you in danger just because we can't mind our own fucking business about something that literally has nothing to do with any of us. Right. Yeah. And like I I came out of the closet when I was 13. I started coming out to my close friends and um then I was working on my family. Usually your family is last. You got to <laughs> you got to set up your tribe before you get kicked out of your home. And a friend of mine who had feelings for me was trying to express those feelings towards me and on the same piece of paper I wrote back to him, you know, write notes back and forth. This is before like everyone had a cell phone. And I wrote him a letter back saying, not interested. I'm not even sure like what I want. I'm 14. I'm not sure right. what I want because I was about 14 at this time. But uh, he had a feelings for me. I didn't have feelings for him. And his mom found the letter because he kept it. Like he, it was a keepsake for him. Mm -hmm. And he calls me crying. We're on our way over. Oh, God. And I'm like, <laughs> how does your mom know where I live? Right. Well, I told her. Why? Why would you do that? It's a whole thing. So then I was forced to walk down the hall. I remember like it was yesterday, walk down the hall to tell my mom I'm, I'm, and I am so guilty of this stigma being a part of the stigma, but I told my mom I was by, I tried to do the soft coming out, which those of us that did that, which I'm super ashamed of, um, created the stigma for bisexual people, uh, more so bisexual men than women, but bisexual people, uh, where it was assumed that you were actually just transitioning to being gay. It wasn't a real thing. It, it wasn't, wasn't a real thing. Mm -hmm. Like, so there could never truly be a bisexual man. He's just gay, not ready to say it. And my mom, <laughs> knowing the type of person that I am, looked at me and goes, no, you're not. <laughs> I was like, uh, mom, I'm bi. And she's like, you're not bi. And I was like, uh, yeah, I am. And she's like, no, you're not. You are either straight or you are gay. You are not bi. I'm like, mom, bi is a real thing. And she's like, oh, I know. <laughs> I know it is. Good for but her. But you Good for her. are either straight or you're gay. You are an extreme person. There is no way you're sitting in the middle of this. Good and for I was her. like, I'm gay. And she's like, okay. Why are you telling me like this? Yeah, in a, and, in and a just, panic. She could probably. Immediately she caught on. She's like, why Why did you come in like. Why shaky and panicky. And, why? and I'm like, oh, my friend's mom's on the way over to. He had a crush and he wrote something, a letter to me, and I responded back to it. She's like, I'm sorry. Uh, someone's coming to out my fucking child. Yeah. And I was like, Yeah. And she's like, Okay. My mom stood behind the door, closed door, staring at the door, waiting for this bitch to knock on the door. And I was like, Good oh, for her. It's on. My mom opened the door. Like she swung that 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 gate door open so fast it hit the woman. And the woman like backed up. And she's like, Why are you here? And she's like, You need to read this letter. She's like, What's in that letter? She goes, It's from uh your son to my son. And Da, 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 da. And my mom's like, um, okay, so it wasn't to you and it wasn't written to me. So why are we reading it? 
She, well, you should know what's happening with your son. She goes, no, no, no. I know what you're here doing about my son. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's none of your business. Right. Well, my mom kind of backed her off to the right. <laughs> she fell off. The woman fell off the porch onto the grass. My mom stood above her and she's like, get up, get in your fucking car. If you ever come back here, I'm going to whoop your fucking ass. Good for mom. And like, the lady like scurried up. Good for mom. With her bad, I remember the woman having a bad perm and like fucking jumping in her car. And she's like, come on to my friend at the time. My mom's like, hey, kid, if you're ever in danger, you let me know. Yeah. Like yeah. fucking. Ugh. Because when we getting outed is the fucking worst, and that's in 1990s. Yeah, that was 98, uh, like 99. We, so that when we that were happened in, early 99. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't like outing someone wasn't a social stigma. Like, oh, faux pas. Yeah. When like, we were teenagers, like, no, there people looked for people to out. Yeah, there were consequences to outing someone, and like now death. <laughs> now back it up even 40 more years. Terry and Carol are dealing with the outing and even it's just, worse even worse but I mean yeah outing is so when I read that like I wasn't in the situation of an actual relationship I was in right. a situation where someone wanted a relationship with me right and I was like collateral damage mm-hmm. like <laughs> he brought the beast to me mm-hmm. <laughs> and I got caught in the fist with the beast in between us yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, I mean, I really wanted to get out of that beast's hand, climb up on his shoulders, be like, just fucking eat him. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> like, uh, but it happens so often that, like you said, like, so many times when in this people book, are in a relationship and one's outed, the other one. Uh, yeah. It's, you're sitting there like, holy shit. It's, I'm next. I'm next. Mm-hmm. I'm next. It's like, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you're sweating bullets. Like it's so, like, I remember feeling like I could take every organ out of my, the core of my body and just throw it on the floor in the hallway before walking across the threshold in my, my mom's room, mm-hmm. my parents' room. Like it was the shittiest feeling. And that was going into a conversation with a parent that you knew was probably somewhat understanding. There are kids out there with parents who are not, and they know. I will say this, like, oh. Um, to all the younger LGBTQ plus people out there listening, you guys need to keep in mind those of us, me being one of them, that came out at a young age when the average age for coming out was maybe 27 to 30 because that's when someone was done with school, right. no longer financial, uh, financially dependent on their parents, had their own financial set, situation set up, knew that if they got outed at work, they weren't going to get fired. That's when people came out. I have seen a lot of young LGBTQ plus people sit there and attack older LGBTQ plus people like oh it's not that big of a, not attack but like brush off flippant very flippant yeah like yeah. oh it's not that big of a deal whatever like yeah it's it happens but it's not that common you need to know what we went through yeah every other person that was my age that was out was forced out of the closet was found out was something and everybody else they were just too scared to say anything and they would stay quiet it was dangerous man yeah like people would turn each other in if it meant saving their own ass mm-hmm. like we've come a long long way and right. I, I love this. Okay. This is why we wanted to talk about LGBTQ plus because right. there are so many times where it's just like, oh, that was beautifully written or, oh, that was a really great way of writing that or, oh, that was said really well. But like at first it's like, oh, I love the way that was said. Oh, I've done, I've felt that. Yeah. Even though this happened in the fifties, still happened to me in the nineties. Right. Happened differently. And I can relate it in a different way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wish we'd had the idea in the beginning of this to carry through, but all four of the sections of this book have a very distinct part of the experience. The LGBT, yes. you know, oh, it's and, like a, it's like a master class and, in the negative effects, right? And so here, reason. here we find Terry abandoned, basically, potentially facing being outed. Carol is being outed right now, fully. Like she's sending back messages in the of, worst way. Yeah, she's sending back messages that they're like. It's not playing. just people found out; they're like dragging her ass through court. It, there's yeah. legal documents that are saying she's her team and her husband's team are meeting. They're playing tapes. Like she's she's going through that. And just like sending back like snapshots, like small messages, telegraphs, like. And you know what I feel like she's getting like little like she's stringing Terry along with it. Yep, that's yep. Terry totally surprised me because I was expecting, in this moment, she was just going to run and hide, because she left the school and she never. She was actually kind of safe where she was at. Yeah, she left the school and she never looked back. And then she got that job in. We learn in the beginning of the book in Penguin Press, she was doing some sort of like artist cover. Yeah. And she got fired. And she she left town. She moved. Like anytime something goes bad, she she's completely uproots. And gone. going back to New York, she's got Richard waiting for her, who had told her this trip's going to go bad, and Carol's going to drop you like a bad habit. Yeah. What I love about that is how he said, "Hey, you're gonna this is gonna you, fail. You're, this is gonna fail, right? 
she gets a letter from him while she's by herself and waiting and her whole fucking attitude towards it is like okay stalker yeah <laughs> like, when she's like okay she, whatever i love that it's this whole letter where he was like i don't actually i don't i don't like you anymore like i used to like you but i don't like you like that you don't and, like, dump me i dump you yeah like it, i didn't even really like you like, like two weeks ago maybe but like today i don't she's like i wasn't even thinking about you and you send me a fucking letter it's this huge letter of like you know what and she like reads the whole fucking thing and she's like all right, <laughs> curls oh, it up, throws it away. The line was the best though, because she's like, she, it's this. She finishes this like diatribe of like, you don't dump me, I dump you, and her line is, she could just picture his face as he was sitting there reading with like, his right, thin lips, with his thin lips <laughs> snarling. Well, she could just be like, I could just see your shitty little expression writing this letter, like, but I thought she was gonna run. You know, oh, yeah. going back to New York meant facing a lot of shit, and so when she was there, and then she got the job, she's floating from hotel to hotel and then she goes and she gets a job as like a secretary and I'm like okay she's gonna set up roots and she's not gonna go back that's yeah totally I thought I the same thing her. I thought like I was not expecting her to like go through this part of the hero's journey yeah I'm gonna set up stakes here where she's making friends with the librarian the woman who runs the diner she's waving to the guy who like she's like established she's like there's a scene where she's like walking down the street waving to so-and-so saying yeah. hi to like okay this is Terry's move to <laughs> she's to like do. I'm out yeah also it took me side by note i fucking hated how she kept saying lighted yeah she lighted her cigarette <sighs> she carol lighted her cigarette she before. righted a letter yeah. <laughs> fucking lighted it said at least 37 yep. times yep every time i heard it i would uh, fucking is that how they spoke in the 50s she picked up her green lighter and lighted it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so she calls carol who's like phone's tapped get off the phone i can't talk my letter is coming. Yeah, she's a full paranoid mode now. Yeah, she's like, look for my letter. Like, I can't talk. And she, like, basically hangs up on her. Yep. And that's when she goes and she has the, the lengthy letter from Carol explaining. She's lost Rindy. And, and you see her going, this is the shitty part, too. Because she always, exp like, throughout it, she expressed concern for what was happening with Carol and Rindy. Right. But it almost felt like, did you lose her yet? Are you mine now? Yeah. That's what it felt like. I was like, uh, yeah, it did. That you're showing your age. Yeah, it did. Because how old was Rindy? She was old enough to walk and talk and ask for shit. Eight, nine. Yeah. Well, no, she even says like, "This is the last doll I'm getting her because she's approaching ten. Yeah, she's approaching ten. Like she was less years away from Rindy's age than Rindy's age itself. Mm -hmm. Rindy's ten. She was nine years older. Like. Rindy's been alive more than half her life and she's like I want your mom <laughs> like, <laughs> right yeah throughout the book she's like I, you, you nailed it it's this like it's weird faux care of like oh did, is she doing okay great can we go to dinner yeah you know so this letter shows up and basically Carol says you know I've lost they've read everything it's not even going to court because I'm waving the white flag I'm not gonna fight this I'm gonna get her maybe a couple of weeks a year yeah if I promise not to see you yeah. Oh, if I, if I and if I don't do this, never talk to another woman. Blah blah blah. blah yeah. Yada, yada, she has yada, to like yada. walk the straight and narrow. She can't have a job. Like, I mean, she basically has this laundry list of things that she has to agree to, and if she agrees to it, she is granted no more than a handful of weeks out of the year to see Rindy. Reading this letter, she's like, "That's it. She's not coming back." I am being asked to come home. She sent her a check. She's like, fuck that. I'm ripping up the check. I'll drive the car back myself. Right. Like, I really like that. She was just like, wouldn't take the money. Mm -hmm. She's like, no, 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 no. It's fine. I got this. I'm convinced Terry was going to stay there and hide to either wait for Carol or avoid going back. Yeah. And facing until, the music. Until she got that letter that Carol was like, I'm choosing to oh, not. And then I'm Richard, choosing in that letter from Richard, he says, I'm telling anybody that will listen. Yeah. Fucking, I'm outing you. Yeah. He's, that's he, another, he's so smug when he says it. That's like, another huh. reason why I was like, she's not going back. She's not yeah. going back. There, there's layer upon layer upon layer of difficulty, and she's cut and run for less than this in the past. Yeah. So when she gets that letter, and it's like, I'm, I can never see you again. I'm choosing Rindy, and the handful of weeks that they're going to give me, something changes in her. And then Abby, the lesbian sleuth, tracks her down. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I had to do to find you? She's like in Chicago or something. And she's yeah. like. And she's driving the car back. And she the, stops the, the whole place. country. Yeah. And you find her in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. And I, I think she meets up with her friend Danny in mm -hmm. Chicago. He was the one that she was walking with when uh, the two men came over in the very beginning 
to get her that job working on that um that stage production so she right. could quit working at the department store and she's walking with danny and danny is like hot yeah <laughs> he's and progressive Dan- as fuck and he's he's, he's a- like i think people should be able to like who they like because yeah. That breath of fresh air was needed before going into part four. Yes, because he shows up. He's left New York. He's on his way to California because he's got a job in Oakland. Yeah. So he stops in Denver because he's like, I like you. Of course you remember that part. I love you. Of course. Oakland. It's not Long Beach. All right, Long Beach. Calm down. Um, <laughs> it's not Long Beach. <laughs> he's like, I like you. And he's just very casual and relaxed about it. He's not like aggressively like toxic masculine about the whole thing. And I love how he's like, three months. Yeah. <gasps> Right, he he has a huge dick. He's <laughs> <laughs> this man is fucking tripod packing. He says, "Write me in three months, but don't write, don't call between now and then, because then I know when you contact me, you're over this person, Carol." And he's cool as can be when she goes into her whole relationship with Carol. Fucking cucumber. Oh, <laughs> I'm not just talking about his dong, but I'm also talking about he's cool as a cucumber. Yeah. And that... That was such good wordplay, by the way. I just fucking well, pat myself on well the back done, on that sir. one. Well done, sir. <laughs> I got to be a perv and a genius at the same time. <laughs> and I'm convinced that Terry knows that if she won't go for Danny, she is a lesbian. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, yeah. That's like... Richard is like, okay, he's a dick. Like, <laughs> In more ways than one. Nickname and moniker. <laughs> but if she wasn't who she... And this is the story of her learning who she is. Yeah. I, I, th- I, I, I think is, Danny is like the fucking hero in the story. He's brought in as like, how about this guy? <laughs> well, it's like, not even that. He's like, hey, look, you know, not everyone feels that way about you. Yeah. I'll accept you. We can be together even though you have a past with Carol. Like, I don't care. And she's attracted to him. When they kissed, she liked it. She didn't like it when Richard kissed her. Yeah. You know? Well, thin lips. I mean. And I think that's part of her journey. I mean, it isn't expressly shared. Like, there's no moment where she consciously has that light bulb moment, but it's like, okay, if, <laughs> if, if Danny doesn't do it for me, yeah. then I only like women. <laughs> so this is when she heads back east. Yep, she's going back. Um, she gets back to New York. She's got a haircut. She's, like, got a pep in her step. I mean, she's... Whole new person. Whole she's new wearing person. green. <laughs> <laughs> she's buying she new lighted clothes. A, she lighted a cigarette. She, yeah, she's... Oh, her own cigarette, by the way, because every time she smokes, it's somebody else's fucking cigarette. Right. There's all these little moments as she's coming back into New York, you know, like reorienting her, her living and room. And a cigarette's a phallic symbol, so that's basically her having her own cigarettes. She's like, I got a dick now, bitch. Yeah. Like, yeah, she spends like $200 on a nice dress because she knows she's going to start networking oh, yeah. for theater jobs. Yeah. Maybe get herself into like set design for TV. She's got Because that's like, easier to break into apparently. She's got this like corporate plan for herself. She'll like, she comes back like, fuck it, I'm going to run this town. Yeah. Like she's ready to be herself. So the juxtaposition- She's a power lesbian at this point. So the juxtaposition to how Carol is now thin in the face and, and wanton skin and she's- It's like, a full role reversal too. Yeah. Because now- She looks sickly because she's been ill, but she's also lost her daughter so whatever that looks like on her like so she meets up with carol right um they go out to dinner and um there's a total role reversal there mm-hmm. as you said she's this new person she comes in re- crossing back across the threshold after having uh fallen in love with someone that she admired mm-hmm. she, there's so much about her that it was all superficial that she really and kind of intimidated her it, it intimidated her sees this like strong person realizes it's all a facade Realizes she gets left in in the dust, that she's just collateral damage to uh, a person's own uh, emotional irresponsibility. And then she f- realizes, I just wasted all that time. Mm-hmm. Luckily, she's young. So she's like, I just wasted all that time. And she can bounce back now. Right. And so she comes back and Carol, because Carol's been emotionally reckless, comes through and she's now like looking at she looks to be the weak one, quote unquote. Yeah. She looks at uh, Terry timid. as the strong one. Mm-hmm. And Terry has the upper hand there. Even Terry's like, oh, I'll pay for this. And she's like, no, no, I'll pay for it. Right. And Terry gets up to leave. And like at one point, and she's like, walk out with me. Don't just like sit here. I don't want you to like. Yeah. Uh, Which is a line that Carol had used on her before. Like, no, no, no. Let's walk out together, darling. Let's, yes. let's hit the street at the same time. Very and much she pulls like, that on her at the end. Yeah, very much pulls like. She hasn't just learned her agency from Carol. She's taken Carol's agency from Carol and mm-hmm. and, and taken it upon herself. Like, mm-hmm. you didn't know how to hold this energy. Right. You didn't know how to hold this agency. So I'm going to take over the agency now. Um, but Carol is now saying like, hey, we could live together. We could be together because she's decided they've given me this whole list of things to be. And because they don't want me to be the word they use is uh, 
degeneration, mm -hmm. de this degenerate behavior. Right. Uh, and Carol says uh, to live against one's grain is dege degeneration by definition. Right. And that was so one of those moments where I'm like, oh, I, don't, I know, like beautifully written. I know what that means. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, it's a choice to be gay. No, the, I, I've always said this. No, the only choice a person makes is to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. And so like, it doesn't matter. Like they're like, we don't want you to do this, that, the other things. I don't have to do any of those things. I'm still this person. Right. Right. Which is why Carol's <laughs> decision to more or less give up Rindy. Yeah. Is in this moment, she's telling Terry, like we could live together, but it's not like she's choosing Terry over. That's how I read it. Yeah. Carol's going to be this person, whether Terry. Carol's agrees choosing herself over, over what she would have to be to have a handful of weeks. Yeah. A year. Yeah. So she knows that she's giving up that to maybe a couple of supervised visits once or twice a year to be herself. I did not read it that she was giving. And I'm sure people can argue that in their book clubs, but I did not read it. And that I she felt was like giving Terry, up Rindy for Terry. I didn't. Read I felt it like way. Terry, a big part of Terry not running right back is, oh, you didn't give her up for me. Yeah. You give her up for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Terry's like, it was all about you, but now it's all about me. Mm -hmm. So like. I like Terry in that moment, but also I'm like, Terry, uh, maybe she's young. Don't bring the kid into it. Uh, like, she's young. You, you can have all that power and be like, and you have a kid that you should be fighting for at the same time. Like <laughs> go for both, not just one. Like, right. but, um, you know, I'm your stepmom now. <laughs> 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 Little brat. So you can just be mean to her once you get her in the house. So, you know, she leaves and they part ways. Um, uh, but before on the way, this is my favorite part. This is so fucking symbolic. She goes, what about those flowers? And she's without missing a beat. Carol, Carol said that, right? Carol is like, what about the flowers I gave you? And without missing a beat, Terry goes, the flowers died. Mm -hmm. Just fucking deadpan. Yeah. And I wrote. And she could see her like shoulder slump when she said it. Yeah. <laughs> the flowers died. And I wrote right after that, dot, 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 with any hope of salvaging this relationship. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't say that part, but I was like, that yeah. was her way of being like, it's over. Yeah. And it wasn't an accident because she took note of how Carol took that comment. Yeah. How her shoulders slumped and her eyes went down. Like Terry said it for impact and she watched for the impact when she said that. Yeah. All right. So they part ways in the street because Terry has to get to this big Broadway party. She has this networking thing where basically they're throwing a party for the actress who's going to headline this play. And she has an opportunity to like rub elbows with a bunch of people who could get her into TV, get her into Broadway shows mm -hmm. for set decorations. So she heads off to that. She invites Carol, yeah. which I thought was interesting. And Carol's like, no, I have this lunch that I have to go to at such and such down the... <laughs> she straight up said like, hey... I'm important now. So yeah. do you like want to tag along with me? Right. She legit was like, you want to tag along? Yeah. That was such a fucking move. <laughs> she said, do you want to tag along? Do you want to tag along? Yeah. Oh, she boss bitches. Like, and she's in her element. All of a sudden you see her talking to directors in the beginning of the book. And now you see her asking questions. I'm looking to get into TV. Do you know anybody in TV? Like she's making. And then she gets caught up in the actress. Medi making headway for herself. And she's got all these connections. And oh, you should have lunch with so-and-so. I mean, she's basically checked Let's up all of the like professional boxes that she wanted to check off at this meeting. And she turns around, and she sees the actress who's walked in. I mean, I think she should have called Abby. I'm like, hey, you know those people you have like connections with? Yeah. Look it up. So, uh, Guinevere, was that her name? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so the actress comes in and drops her like full length fur coat to the floor. She drops her animal it, cruelty right there in front of everybody. Oh, she makes an entrance. And there's a part where they lock eyes and the actress lingers in Terry's eyes longer than anybody that she's looked at and in that moment Terry knew she's like Carol yeah okay so. and she also knew I can now spot when someone's like Carol what Candace is saying here I'm a gay explain what she means is now she has gaydar exactly her gaydar is pinging like off the charts it's like gaydar um but it's not pinging. it's not just that she's figured out that she has gaydar but she recognizes in that moment that she she's attracted to her yeah and she can like picture what would it be like if she went up to her room which the actress basically says we're having a small party upstairs you should join me yeah she comes on to her and she feels something she can feel something in her like belly that she's like attracted to her and she realizes it wasn't just carol yeah everyone is carol at this point point. In, in and in that moment it, as a bisexual woman and there's always that thought was it just a i'm not a bisexual woman don't call me that me oh yeah that makes more sense I, I love that she realizes, nope, I like girls. It wasn't just Carol. Yeah. It wasn't just the thing with Carol. Not only do I have gaydar, not only can I lock eyes and be like, 
Hey. <laughs> Not only am I pulling some hot actress tail. But it wasn't some infatuation like Richard said. It wasn't that I had this fling that it was just Carol as a person and I normally like men but it was just this like in that moment she realizes nope oh and what's beautiful about this situation is that like I said Carol is was boot camp for her Mm -hmm. like it was like the Olympics for her she sees this woman and this woman's beautiful jaw dropping makes an entrance all this and she's like I have power over you Mm -hmm. in that moment she's like I have the power over you yeah she leaves the party yeah. Because in that moment, she realizes it wasn't a Carol thing. And it's this beautiful moment where she realizes this is who I am. Yeah. I, it, it was not about Carol. It was about who I am, who me as a yeah. person. And we, you know, we talked a little bit about bisexuality and people think it's not real or it's not. And you get that a lot when you're in your first relationship or you're having like those first moments where it's like, well, it's just a schoolgirl crush. Like, oh, I reacted every time Dick said that. Yeah. Or it's like, it's just a schoolgirl crush. It's like. Or maybe this I love is- the part where he's like, wow, you're really crushing on this girl. I'm like, they talk like that about that? <laughs> I'm like, don't they say like, nah, you got a fancier or something. And I, I think that's why Terry leaves the party. She knows that she could lock down Guinevere. She knows, oh, yeah. She knows. But she leaves she the party because she's like. Big dick energy at this point. Yeah. She she realizes, nope, I am. This is who I am. And I choose Carol. And in that moment, she chooses to leave the party and yeah. go to where she knows she's having lunch because she does oh, she does the you know the montage rom com run she leaves the party yeah. she's running to where she knows Carol's gonna have lunch she walks in she's scanning the restaurant they lock eyes and Carol like recognizes and her and like that, in her little meek ways and like, then she just sort of like does this small little like oh, hi. hi sort of wave so you want me and she's like no nope. <laughs> walks out <laughs> psych it's <laughs> not what happened. <laughs> I mean, it feels like but it. But that's that's it, where they, they sort of lock eyes and, you know, Carol sort of gives that, like, acknowledgement wave of, you came back, and that was the end. That was the end. I liked this one. This was one. I'm just kidding. I, I actually liked it. It was, a, it was a good book to listen to. Um, and let me tell you, writing really does matter because, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're just really boring and your eyes glaze over, you start thinking <laughs> of something else. <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> <laughs> all right should we do bookends let's do bookends all right bookends oh, it's been so long i know it's weird all <laughs> right bookends this is where we ask you guys the questions that we think you should be asking yourselves first one up who are you recommending the price of salt to um any straight guy that thinks he can turn a lesbian okay that's a good one this is gonna be waiting a long time for that part to happen and it's not <laughs> yeah uh i think <laughs> i think queer youth needs to read stuff like this yeah I, I you know what like i did appreciate i was gonna make mention this earlier when it comes to the erotic part mm-hmm. like you don't get gushy noises you know what i mean like right it has a very young adult novel approach to the sex scenes we're about to have it this is after having it Right. It's like the fade out, fade back in. Yeah, it's the fall on the bed, cut to the next morning. Yeah. Very much that. Very made for TV. But I, I think, you know, a lesbian love story set in 1952 is not a bad thing for queer youth to yeah. read. Especially young gay men. Young gay men need to read this. We talk about what it was like for us in the 90s, but like even for me. It's because. Like, good. Uh, geez. Whether you're gay or straight man, mm-hmm. like emotional connection is not always the first thing that they look for Mm -hmm. and i think seeing how deep emotions can run between two people i think that's really important for young men in general Mm -hmm. that's that's a good call out to to see so what questions are we recommending people take to their book club if they're going to read the price of salt together oh what do you got terry notices everyone's hands all the time yeah, who is she? Jack on the Titanic? And I there we didn't really talk about it. I don't know if there's like symbolism there. And it's interesting that it's not the it's not the author because Terry's the one that notices hands. It's it starts with Ms. Rovacek in the beginning, and I thought maybe it was just specific to young, old, you know, meeting a stranger, but So the symbolism of the hands is a way for people to recognize um a, a person's status in an interaction mm-hmm. so uh it can tell your history it can tell your nerves it can tell so it, it's a good indicator for a way to a uh, person to read your haptics basically mm-hmm. yeah so it's interesting knowing that that that's the symbolism behind it i i would recommend explore that you know because it's not always what you would think that carol has beautiful hands and you know Richard has you know strong hands she she picks out very interesting things to talk about and i would say discuss that and see if you think that there's something i think i think what would be a great discussion Uh uh-huh would be the road trip itself okay i know it's a big portion of the book but like the symbolism of the road trip 
they're both going on a journey. Mm -hmm. And although they go on the journey together, mm -hmm. they go on two different journeys. Yeah. So what are the differences in the journeys? Um, what's the significance of one's journey ending abruptly and the other one's continuing? Yeah. Terry more and more frequently finding ways to pay because Carol refuses to let her pay. So she has to like pay for room service while Carol's in the shower. Yeah. Like over the course of the trip, there's a little moment. That's a really good question. There's so, a lot of things you could talk about mm -hmm. in the journey together. All right. Casting call. Now this Ooh. is a movie. It is a movie. And I didn't really like pay attention to the cover of, cause I have the alternate um, mm -hmm. title Carol. And I was just oh. like, oh, can Kate Blanchett would play Carol so well. And I like <laughs> looked up the cast after I wrote my cast down. Kate Blanchett's playing Carol. Yeah. I'm like, God damn it. Why did I choose hair? <laughs> I should have been a casting director. Yeah. I have someone for Miss Robichuk. Oh, okay. Because she's a cameo girl. Okay. And this actress is known for cameos. Okay. Um, Kathy Bates. Nice. I think Kathy Bates would play a great, where you're like, oh, that's Kathy. And then she's not really in the movie for the rest of the time. Yeah, you think like, oh, she's going to so, be yeah. there. Yeah, that's a good one. I kept picturing the um, the herbology teacher from Harry Potter. Oh, she's great. She is filthy. Have you seen her on TikTok? No. Oh, she is filthy. Oh, no, I'll have to look her up. Okay, all right, let's start with Carol. Um, so you had Kate Blanchett? I had Kate Blanchett, yes. I had Charlize Theron. <gasps> yeah, yeah. I feel like the only thing about Charlize that I wouldn't put there is Charlize doesn't have that, ugh, I'm not saying Kate Blanchett is aged, but that aged elegance. Mm -hmm. I think that Charlize Theron will always have like a fresh elegance versus an experienced elegance. Right. Like. To be juxtaposition to Terry's age is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I see that. You're wrong, but I see it. Okay. Well. <laughs> I also have a big crush on Charlie Theron, so I just want to put her in whatever. I have a big crush on I, anybody that doesn't is an idiot. Uh, Terry, who do you have for Terry? Who did you have for Terry? Because I had someone for Terry, then I realized Terry was nineteen, and I was like, okay, that's not it. I had Ariel Winter. Who? The daughter from Modern Family. Which one? There's two. The one that wears glasses. Oh yeah, she. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm just trying to picture her with that new haircut, and I'm like. Mm. <laughs> Probably not good of on her. Of course, it's the hair. Um, <laughs> I forgot she has a haircut. I was actually going to mix it up. I was going to take it away from just white people. Um, For Terry? Mm -hmm. who, do you, who do you have? I was going to put uh, Kravitz. Oh, yeah. We've had her before. For I like her in this, too. And I just think she would look amazing with like a cute little cropped, like... You in the hair. Waved. <laughs> oh, my God. She'd be... I think I've seen her in that hair before which is great but um what's her first name zoe zoe kravitz yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i would put zoe kravitz in that position i think she could play 19 easy all right abby abby i had sarah paulson is that who's in the movie is she i wouldn't be surprised as soon as you said it i'm like they probably had to have cast her in that movie i have to look now sarah paulson yeah i'd have sarah paulson oh I wouldn't that, mind. that t i don't even want to say my answer now that's perfect <laughs> oh, who's your i had Catherine say? hahn who Catherine hahn parks and rec poncho oh <laughs> I love that you said poncho because so many people used that like that that clips audio and it would always stop before poncho. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine Hahn though. I like Poncho. I, we, we used to say that shit in my house all the time. I like that for Abby. Oh yeah, Catherine Hahn. But Sarah Paulson is like, oh She's good. Um Carol cast. It was. I am so it's good perfect. at this. I am so good at this. It's perfect. Oh, yeah, Sarah Paulson. Oh, fuck, I'm good at this. Because yeah. originally I had Sarah Paulson. As soon Paulson, as you said it, I was like, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> I, I originally had Sarah Paulson for Teresa. I originally had really? Sarah Paulson for Teresa. But then when I was like, oh, she's 19, I was like, no, not that. Mm -hmm. And then, I'm sorry, but I could not stop thinking about Sarah Paulson and her, like, wife. Like, oh. as Teresa and Carol now. Oh, Like, years later. Yeah. Like, they did a fast forward. Well, you know what's funny is I had um, Christina Ricci for Terry. Oh. <gasps> And then I thought, she, then I landed on Charlie Theron and I was like, eh, I'm not going to repeat that because they did Monster together. Oh, yeah. I mean, who'd you have for Richard? I didn't. Oh, just come on. Think. Just try. I usually do mine on the fly. Well, either. it doesn't fit the age range. So maybe if you, if I could find a younger version of him, but. Well, Lee, we can do past Lee, and present. Leif Shriver. Okay. He has a little brother. Okay. But his little brother is kind of a dude. She was like this serial. Well, did then he would be perfect. Did you watch SVU? Oh, yeah, because he was like a serial killer. Oh, that's right. Okay, then, yeah. I'm the gonna one that she like beats the shit I'm out gonna, of. I'm going to choose him then. Okay. Um, so I was actually thinking of somebody that I like to play a shitty role for him. Okay. Um, I thought of two people. 
Uh, so the one I'm going to go with actually has thin lips. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, Robert. What is? Oh, I can't think of his name right now. What was he in? Twilight. Robert Pattinson. Robert Pattinson. So I thought of him. Okay. And I also thought of uh, Captain America. Chris Evans. Really? Yeah. But then I thought, no, we've all seen the pictures. Danny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, once he made a joke about it, I was like, all right, he's cool with it. I'm going to go look. <laughs> well, when we first meet Richard and his personality, I was thinking Elijah Wood. And then the Too more, short. And then the more she described him, the more I'm like, yeah, that's doesn't. And then the. You know, no offense, Elijah, if you were listening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You want to take us out? All right, guys, thank you for joining us for another episode of Cracking Spines Podcast, Season 2, Episode 1. We are official now that we're on Season 2. Next week, we are going to be talking... What's the book called? Uh, We changed it at the last second. Where We Go From Here by Lucas Roca. Yeah, what she said. Where We Go From Here by Lucas Roca. Go check us out on all of our social medias. You can find those on our link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Cracking Spines. Also, we have started a Patreon just in time for you to give us money. Patreon.com <laughs> slash Cracking Spines Podcast. We are going to have some behind the scenes stuff there, uh, extended clips from different stories, anecdotal stuff that we uh, have to cut out a lot to save time. Um, yeah, from... we'll give you guys full conversations that you might have missed. Mm-hmm, like when she interrupts me when I'm saying something. Uh, <laughs> uh, you'll get a lot more of the banter. Co-host. and. <laughs> Sorry. I can't work like this. <laughs> I am the talent. Like, you were a lot quieter in season one. <laughs> yeah, fuck. She found a voice. All of a sudden, she has agency. <laughs> How'd that happen? How do I join the patriarchy? <laughs> wonder how that happened <laughs> anyway uh yeah you guys can go find us over there we're also gonna have like polls and we're gonna be doing live streams over there uh once we hit 30 subscribers so uh yeah go over there give us money we like that stuff and we're out I did appreciate the anti-capitalist nature of uh, of the, it was very much like don't exploit. It's, there was like a there was commentary about the exploitation of workers for the profit of the company. Mm-hmm. That was kind of an underlying commentary that was going on there, which I really appreciated as a leftist. Right. Because you know, two girls bumping clams, not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the opposite of that. I like sword fights. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. Just to make sure you guys knew. But she- I'm a homo. <laughs> yeah, big gay. One, Huge. One more? Okay, sure. I fart glitter. There we go. Trifecta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't because I hate glitter, but... <laughs>